uh, my professional field is cosmology. That is to say, I, I study the, the large-scale structure of the universe and its origin and its future. Um, I did my PhD in Cambridge with Stephen Hawking, and then in 1985 I moved to Queen Mary College, it's now Queen Mary University of London, where I'm a professor of mathematics and astronomy. In fact, I retired just a year ago, so I'm now an emeritus professor. That's my professional activity, but I've always had a, a, a lifelong interest in psychical research. I, I was served as president of the, of the SPR for four years, the beginning of the millennium. Um, and I also have a, a long-standing interest in the relationship between science and religion. And I suppose that is reflected with my involvement with the scientific and medical network. I was the chair of the SMN for, for four years. So um, I have a general interest in, in matter, mind, and spirit, and, and I feel it's absolutely crucial to try and link those three areas. areas. So <coughs> although my professional field is, is, involves physics and the domain of matter, um, I've spent a lot of my spare time focusing on problems to do with mind and spirit, and in particular my, my dream, if you like, is to have an expanded picture of physics which can accommodate consciousness, um, and in particular various phenomena associated with consciousness like mind and spirit. To me, the, the main problem with, with current science, and in particular physics, because I'm speaking as a physicist, is that it is, it is purely materialistic. It assumes that there's only one level of reality, the level of matter, and that everything can be reduced to sort of basic physics. So you've got materialism and, and reductionism. And personally, I feel that both those assumptions are invalid. And of course, the main problem with those assumptions is that they neglect the existence of consciousness, which is, which is fundamental even to all our scientific enterprises. And so... As many physicists have pointed out, indeed. As many physicists have pointed out, however, it has to be stressed that it's still a minority of physicists. I mean, most physicists do probably just adapt the adopt the materialistic perspective. But there are, of course, a, a large number of, of eminent physicists who have appreciated the importance of consciousness and, and the absurdity of trying to have a picture of the world which eliminates any reference to the mind. I mean, the irony is that at the, the picture of fundamental reality which we now have from physics is essentially a, a picture of mind. Because, I mean, our concept of reality bears very little relationship to common sense notions of reality. It's, it's basically a, a, a very mathematical, uh, intellectual concept of reality, which in some sense can only be understood as, as something which is mind-like. Well, if one believes that, that consciousness is fundamental, um, the question is then, are you going to have to go beyond physics itself, or even beyond science itself, to address the issues? Or can you address the problem of consciousness and associated phenomena within the domains of, of, of physics, or within the domains of science? And there are really two steps there. First of all, there is the question of whether the, prob the problem of my mentality and consciousness can be addressed scientifically. And then there's a more specific question of whether it can be addressed within the, issue, within the context of physics. Now, I think most people, especially those associated with the Galileo Commission report, would accept that the, this is a legitimate domain of scientific inquiry, the, the problem of consciousness and mind and, and even spirit. It isn't quite so obvious that it is part of physics. My view, though, is that it is part of physics, because I'm a physicist, and I, I'm passionately enthused by the success of physics in understanding the physical world, and it seems natural for me that we should try and expand physics to accommodate mind and consciousness. And although many physicists think that cannot be true, because many physicists will take the view that physics is basically dealing with a third-person perspective of the world and, and cannot address the first-person perspective, which of course is what is required if you want a model of consciousness. Um, although that's the mainstream view, I, I disagree with that. 
I think there is evidence from physics itself that consciousness does play a fundamental role in the world and even in physics. Now, the evidence for that comes from various directions. Perhaps it comes from quantum theory. Many people have pointed out that quantum theory is the, is the one point in physics where the observer seems to play a role. And it's even been suggested that maybe consciousness plays a role in the collapse of the wave function. Let's not agree completely. I mean, it's a controversial view. Many physicists disagree with that, but at least many respectable physicists have suggested it. Other perspectives come, for example, studies of the anthropic principle, which, which says there are certain features of the universe which seem to be required fine-tuned in order that observers can be here. Again, suggesting that maybe the mind is somewhat fundamental to physics. So I think even within physics itself, there, is, there are hints that one needs an expanded physics which is going to accommodate consciousness. And Although many physicists deny that and say it, necessarily consciousness is beyond the domains of physics because it's a first person rather than a third person perspective, um, I disagree with that. And we have to realize that physics itself does not have a final picture. Personally, I, I take the view that the brain is a filter of consciousness rather than a, a producer of consciousness. Now, of course, again, this is not the mainstream view among scientists, certainly not among neuroscientists, and not among most physicists. It, it is assumed by most scientists that the brain produces consciousness. And of course, there's no doubt that there are these inter intimate connections, neural, correl neural correlations between our experiences and what's in the brain. However, I think you can make a very strong case, and many, many people have, of course, that the brain is merely a filter of consciousness, that's to say a transmitter of consciousness, rather like a TV set. No one believes that what you see on the TV screen is inside the TV, it's, 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 it's outside and being somehow broadcast to, to the TV. And I think consciousness is like that. I think that consciousness is outside the brain and is merely manifested through the brain. But in saying that, you have to distinguish between what I call consciousness with a little c, which is our individual consciousness, and consciousness with a big c, which is, if you like, this one mind, which is supervening a, 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 and, and being transmitted through the individual brains. So I take this, I suppose, rather religious view, if you like, that there is a one mind with a capital M, or one consciousness with a capital C, which merely perceives the world, perceives the universe through all these billions of brains, which are merely channels. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the Sersen project um, goes back, um, well, at least 10 years, um, and it was organized at the Esalen Center, in Big Sur in California, and it, there were a series of workshops discussing this whole issue of, of whether you can have an extended science which accommodates consciousness and, and, and even concepts such as survival, the word sursem actually uh, yes. means survival seminar, so even concepts like survival of consciousness after death are, are involved there. And it led to two impressive volumes which were edited by Ed Kelly and, and colleagues. The first volume was called Irreducible Mind, which was basically producing the data that there are certain phenomena which cannot be produced, cannot be explained by a simple reductionist um, view in which the brain generates consciousness. So that, if you like, is the evidence for, for consciousness not being generated by the brain, the, 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 the basic phenomena which are described in Irreducible Mind. And then there was a second volume which I was involved in, and, and that was called Beyond Physicalism, and that was where particular theories were presented as to how you might extend physics and science beyond the normal materialist reductionist view. Within the areas of science, within the general areas of science, of course, I, I would say that parapsychology, although a taboo word in most scientific quarters, is going to play a crucial role because that provides the scientific evidence. And I, I don't just mean the scientific evidence for phenomena like telepathy and, and precognition, which can 
be studied in the laboratory. I mean evidence for more subjective experiences, if you like, like out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, and mystical experiences. Because although those, are, although those are more experiential and harder to study in the laboratory, they're, they're all part of the huge range of, of phenomena which you're trying to accommodate in your extended or post-materialistic science. So that's from the point of view of, uh, of science, if you like. But thinking more specifically from the point of view of physics, I would say that we need to somehow extend physics in a way which is going, will allow us to accommodate these phenomena. Clearly you can't do that within the normal classical view, the Newtonian or, or relativistic models. It's sometimes suggested that quantum theory will allow you to do that because quantum theory does allow you to make reference to consciousness and the observer. So there's a clue that consciousness may not be irrelevant, but may be fundamental. However, personally, I disagree with the view that everything can be, all these phenomena can be explained by quantum theory. I mean, we don't understand quantum theory anyway, so saying quantum theory explains mind wouldn't really amount to much. It would just replace one mystery by another mystery. But also, it seems to me clear that quantum theory even if it is relevant, and I do think it's relevant to these phenomena, it can only explain a small fraction of the phenomena which are sometimes called psi. Yes. I mean, it may be able to explain non-locality, the connection between brains, if you like, in different places on the surface of the Earth. It may be able to explain certain aspects of precognition. But it doesn't begin to explain the experience of mind itself. It doesn't begin to explain out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, mystical experiences. So it seems clear to me you need to go beyond the standard quantum paradigm. And, and this is what the whole Galileo Commission... And that is what the whole Galileo Commission is about. But the, and the only thing is where I, to some extent, disagree perhaps with some of the people involved in the Galileo Commission. I think that that extension can be done within physics. I mean, I think there is an assumption, which may turn out to be correct, that this is necessarily beyond physics. But I, I have a hunch that, in fact, physics itself will, will be able to expand to accommodate these phenomena. Partly that may occur through the quantum, but as I say, you've got to go beyond that. You need a paradigm which is deeper than the standard quantum exactly. paradigm. And that's very much what we're arguing um, yeah. as, as a whole. Most scientists do adopt the materialistic reductionist perspective, and, and there's huge sociological pressures to preserve that view. Um, how do we do it? First of all, of course, it's done through, through the scientific journals. I mean, it would be very hard to publish some of my ideas with how physics can be extended to accommodate consciousness within a physics journal, but there are more specialized journals which do do that. Um, for example, this is the Journal of Consciousness Studies, the Journal of Scientific Exploration, and of course there's the Scientific and Medical Networks Paradigm Explorer, and, and the so Journal of the Society for Psychical Research. So there are specialized journals which do have articles conveying these important ideas. And so the question is, how do you get those journals to be read by mainstream yes. scientists? And, yes. and, um, and at the moment, they're only read by a minority. You know, it's, I mean, I, I publish some of my articles in, in some of the aforementioned journals, but knowing very well that most of my scientific colleagues are not actually going to read them. Yes. Because they're, they're already overwhelmed with their own journals, which they have to read. Maybe, maybe you could say something specifically about your contribution to the latest issue of the Journal of Scientific Exploration. Which Absolutely. I mean, well, Reber and Alcock wrote a paper claiming that they don't even have to look at the evidence for Psi because they know it can't be right. It can be excluded a priori. And, uh, well, lots of people have said that. But the reason they say that, they say it can be excluded because it's not compatible with physics. And we know yes. physics works. Yes. And uh, this produced uh, a torrent of uh, reactions and uh, a series of articles were published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, including one by myself. Um, and, and I made the point um, that this argument that uh, psi can be excluded because it's incompatible with, with, with physics 
is, is, is basically baloney, which of course many other people pointed out as well. But I, I was pointing it out in my capacity as a physicist, yes, because, because um, I am a physicist who, who believes passionately in the power of physics, but believes it can be extended. On the other hand, I also pointed out that there's no doubt from a sociological perspective that many physicists share the view of Reber and Alcock. The factor of the matter is that most of my physics colleagues, including many for whom I have tremendous respect, such as um, Stephen Hawking, who is my friend and PhD supervisor, they w would reject these phenomena or at least say they could have nothing to do with physics. And of course, that's what I, what I disagree with. Actually, I never object to people saying they don't have time to look at the evidence. Yes, what people don't always realize yeah. is that um, physics is now, science now is so specialized, you know, there's such a this huge proliferation of knowledge and papers, you don't have time to look outside your own field. And so I'd never, I never criticize people for um, saying they don't have time to look at the evidence. I only criticize people when they don't look at the evidence and still say it's, it's rubbish. But anyway, my, my, the main point I was making in my reply was that it simply isn't, it is true that standard physics, that's to say relativity theory and quantum theory, cannot explain psychic phenomena. And it is true that you, 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 you can't invoke the normal sort of force or field which we're used to studying to explain th these phenomena. But the point I was making is that physics itself is incomplete. We know there has to be a final far paradigm of physics, which in some sense marries relativity theory and quantum theory into f some final theory. And we're not there. We don't yet know what that final theory is. So to say that these phenomena can't be real because they're incompatible with relativity theory and quantum theory makes no sense because we know our final science, physical theory is not going to be compatible. It'll be compatible with them, but it will go beyond them. Yeah. So my own, my own dream, if you like, is that the final theory of physics, which if you like is the theory of quantum gravity or the theory of everything, necessarily will in some sense make some reference to mind and consciousness. Otherwise That's, it won't be a final theory. Otherwise it won't be a final theory because no. people talk about a theory of everything which is so arrogant because we're really only talking about a theory of particle physics. Yes. I mean there was that wonderful movie The Theory of Everything about Stephen Hawking and his, his love affair with his first wife Jane and the title of the, of the movie was Theory of Everything which of course is the theory Stephen was devoting, devoted his life to trying to find. And yet the film was about love, which is the one thing a theory of everything is clearly never going to no, address. Very good. If you believe that consciousness can exist independent of the brain, that consciousness can perhaps even survive the death of the body, of course that has huge implications for our outlook on life. On the other hand, we can look at parts of the world where they already believe that. I mean, we can look in India, for example, where a billion people believe in principle in survival of death, and they don't believe that the, this life is all there is. They believe that the soul can survive after death and, and be reincarnated or whatever. And so you might say, well, has that been a good thing? And actually, in a funny way, it's not it could be a bad thing, because once, once you believe that your consciousness is just just generated by the brain is just inhabiting this this brain like a you get into a motor car for a short period in a certain way it devalues life so in a certain sense there's a danger in that you know that once you accept that all minds are connected in some sort of one mind then that also can have certain disadvantages you know because you there's no privacy anymore um, and so everything has both positive and negative aspects. On the other hand, the realization that we are all in some sense connected to other human beings, we are all one, that obviously has a very positive aspect from a moral perspective, because how we treat other people is going to be affected if we believe how we affect them ultimately reflects back on ourselves, because how we treat other people is how we treat ourselves. So it has both positive and negative aspects. Um, because, and the fact of the matter is that uh, we, regardless of whether we adopt a materialist philosophy, there's no doubt that the world is very much, is very materialistic. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
And, and that is what determines political and social developments, the fact we are a materialistic society and, and a very, in some sense, a, a thriving society because of the advances of science. And I've always said that actually people will only ever really end up believing in these phenomena, you know, non-local consciousness, psi or whatever, if there is some practical application. So, for example, if you can produce a psychic light switch or something like okay. that, then okay. people will begin to believe these phenomena. Right. So long as it's just in the ethereal world of mystical experiences, people are always going to say, well, I'm a material, you know, I'm more interested in how much money I can make and yes. how comfortable yes. I can live my life physically. Um, it, it would be all, I think it will be rather abstract. What's going to really make a difference is when these phenomena not only are acknowledged as real, but actually have a practical implication for how we live our lives. And I, I mentioned the psychic light bulb as a sort of yes, jocular yes. example, but there are many other ways in which these phenomena, I mean, med medicine, for example, there could be huge respects in which medicine could be um, expanded if one accepts these phenomena, as indeed it already is in areas of complementary medicine. And then is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of the sort of final reflection? Well, I would like to just add one point, because when I talk about how physics can be extended to accommodate these phenomena. I never actually said what my model was. So I would just like to push my own particular yes. model, which I've been very keen on, which is that actually what one needs is a, a sort of higher dimensional model, which provides an extended view of reality. In the normal, straightforward, classical view of physics, we have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. But now even conventional particle physics invokes extra dimensions. So, for example, uh, obviously the three dimensions of space and one of time was combined in Einstein's four-dimensional relativity theory. But then Kaluza and Klein said you needed a fifth dimension to explain electromagnetism, and then superstring theory came along in the mid-1980s and said you needed another another dimension, 10 dimensions, and then M theory came along in 1990s and said you need 11 dimensions in total. So you have sort of four macroscopic dimensions of space and time and, and, and seven internal dimensions. So, and so in this picture, you, you can think of the physical world as like a, a brain, B-R-A-N-E, a, a slice of the higher dimensional bulk. So that's just one particular view, which comes out of M theory, not the only view, but one view. Um, so my approach is to say, well, if these extra dimensions exist, what actually is in them? Okay. What is off the brain? Well, the only things we're aware of are our mental experiences. So it seems natural to me to say that those higher dimensions can be the arena of, of mental experience. And the point is, the key point about mental experience and, and many psychic experiences is that they do seem to involve some space which is not the same as physical space but related to it. So for example, even normal experiences like um, dreams involve a space and then if you get to more exotic phenomena like out-of-body experiences it involves a, a space. Apparitions people see ghosts, but they're clearly not physical objects, but they seem to exist in some space. And even yeah. mystical experiences yeah. seem to require some form of space. So to me, a key thing about our theory of mind, our extended theory of physics, is that it must involve a higher concept of space, a higher dimensional concept of space. And since physics already has the concept of higher dimensions, it seems natural to say maybe that is going to be the way to go. Maybe our theory, the way of of reconciling physics and mind, matter and mind, is to say that reality is higher dimensional and that physics just deals, materialism just deals with one lower dimensional size. I'm not talking here about a final theory. First of all, we don't have a final theory of, you know, yes. within M theory. Pe people argue about what the nature of that final theory is going to be. And I certainly don't have a final theory for explaining uh, these mental and spiritual phenomena. Um, but nevertheless, it just seems natural to try and, and, and link those ideas. And you must bear in mind that not all physicists believe in higher dimensions either. I mean, some people think all these, you know, the approach of M theory is more mathematics than physics, because we still don't have any direct evidence for these extra dimensions, okay. for example, from the Large Hadron Collider. So, so there's a controversy even within physics as to whether these higher dimensions should count as physics. But at least 
respectable physicists work on these problems. And some of the biggest brains on the planet, you know, work on these problems. And, it, and it's sociological respectable. Now, I would say that there's probably more evidence for higher dimensions that comes from psychic experience than comes from experimental yeah, very physics. True, very true. Nevertheless, I mean, it's, it's natural to try and link them. And, and I, my, my own approach is, is not dependent on M theory being right. If M theory turns out to be wrong, it, this higher dimensional view of reality doesn't get demolished. But nevertheless, if M theory turns out to be right, it's, it's nice if one can make that link. Because I'm just trying to show how in principle there may be a way of extending physics to accommodate these exotic, normal and paranormal and transpersonal experiences. And higher dimensions seem to me the way to go. 